We're sharing our studio today with a couple of dogs who happen to be nervous about all the storm that's going on outside and the thunder and the lightning and that kind of stuff, which is a little apropos because today's message is about fear. Fear is an emotion that can paralyze your entire life. It can stifle your growth, it inhibits you from taking action, and in the grand scheme of things, it's an emotion that can stop you from leading a passionate and joyful life. Today, we define fear so that it can be easily understood and so that you can take better control of it in your life. On your mark, get, go. Welcome to the I Am Podcast, where we answer all the questions about spirituality and inner peace that you ever wanted to ask, and where we learn the secrets of humanity and divinity and dog entity through a better understanding of both. I am your host, Sean Webb. Spirituality is the God-based existence within you that exists both beyond the body and mind. But to be able to find that God-based portion of you, you first need to understand the distractions that the body and the mind can throw in front of you that keep you away from finding that incredible, blissful, peaceful, spiritual self that lies hidden within you. And that is why we have the Body, Mind, Spirit 101 series, to discuss those distractions, to find them like no one in the history of the world ever has to find them, so that we can eventually understand them and be able to identify them when they pop up to distract you from our spirit within. Because the spirit within is awesome. It answers all the questions we could ever ask and provides the permanent joy and inner peace that we all seek as humans. To help our efforts, in episodes two through 13, we discussed the body-mind-spirit model, and we took a little bit closer look at the mind and how these four components here, called the emotional influence system, create all the negative emotions out here, and how breaking just one of these components can realistically remove negative emotions from your life entirely. And this week, we're covering the last of the big individual emotions before being able to move forward into explaining other parts of the model. And don't worry, the few things that we haven't yet covered in the emotions section, specifically happiness and emotional love, will be covered in future episodes. They can just be better understood when shown in comparison to their spiritual counterparts that we'll discuss later in the model. And as always, you can get our diagrams in PDF format from IamSpirituality.com. And by the way, we are now posting the suggested reading list on the website as well due to popular demand. Thanks for your feedback. Keep that stuff coming. Okay, so fear. What is fear? It's easy to think about how we're afraid of things and to think about specific examples of when we've been afraid, but why does it occur within us? What are the specific conditions that need to exist in the mind to subconsciously create the fear response within us? Thankfully, these are all simple questions that can be answered with a very simple definition of fear. So what we'll do is present that definition from the body-mind-spirit model perspective, run through some examples of fear to prove that it works, then also prove it out by explaining the most common fears in humans, and then run through some common real-life situations to discuss how we can overcome fear by hitting fear where it hurts. Okay, so what is fear? Well, the official definition of fear is simple. Fear is nothing more than the mind's subconscious reaction to a pending potential internal devaluation of the ego. That's it. Put more simply, it's the mind's reaction to a situation where there is a pending threat to the laundry list of the mind's understanding of self, otherwise known as the ego, which we show as one of these and as usual, let's lean on some examples to help clarify what all this means. A simple example we've used in the past is where a bear walks out of the woods 20 feet in front of you and you experience fear. Well, what is happening there is that your mind perceives that your body and potentially even your life itself, two things that are very much a part of your understanding of your world, are being threatened with a rather large potential devaluation there, as dictated by the presence of that big old bear. And so your mind generates fear as a result to that threat of its perceived identity. Our life and body could potentially be devalued here. Yikes! Now from this standpoint, there is an argument that can be made that fear is a natural and beneficial development within humans. From a biological perspective, among other things, fear triggers the release of adrenaline, which can help you get out of a pretty sticky situation, right? So fear is good, right? Well, 
Not quite. Although the basic biological system of fear that gives you the extra speed to run from that bear or that triggers via a natural fear of heights for you to back away from that ledge so you don't fall over it, although that can be beneficial, the natural system of fear also goes rather haywire when it starts to create fear about things like speaking in front of a crowd or fears about not wanting to let go of a bad relationship or fear of committing to do something. Those aren't so beneficial. And how do those fears come about? How does fear go from being beneficial to detrimental? Well, this is where the ego enters the fear equation. See, although fear can be seen as a natural and beneficial reaction to threats that could shorten your life, fear is also the reaction that comes about at any time any portion of your mindful understanding of existence is threatened with a devaluation. And that includes any idea you've attached to within the mind. For instance, when Barack Obama was elected president, there were a group of folks who were genuinely fearful. When the election was going his way and during the time that he was being sworn into office, there were people who were actually sitting on their couch, trembling from the idea that there was a democratic black president taking office. Why? Because the fact that the Democratic Party was winning at the time created a potential loss of control to those minds who identified with being Republican. A loss of power is an egoic devaluation. Second, the fact that a black man was taking office threatened the evaluation of a lot of people who identified with being white. A black man is president. Oh my goodness, are white people like me losing power? Are black people taking over? And this is a potential devaluation of those individuals' limited understanding of self. Therefore, fear. And you could take that scenario as far as you want. The Second Amendment guys were fearful about losing something they're very attached to with their gun rights. The low taxes people were fearful about losing something they're very attached to, the right to keep more of their money. Anyone who experienced fear to President Obama taking office, and there were a number of people who did, was experiencing their mind's reaction to a potential devaluation to something on their ego list which they identified with. And this definition works 100% of the time, but let's zip through the most common fears in the world just to make sure. Okay, so the following are the most common fears among all humans. Fear of death. Okay, no brainer. The mind obviously sees your life well within its mindful understanding of self, and so any thoughts about death, a potential devaluation to said life results in fear. This is why people who identify with being a spirit or having a spiritual component that survives beyond their body, which becomes part of their ego, those folks are less afraid of death, fear of heights and or fear of flying. Now, there's a natural tendency for the body to have a reaction to heights. Babies are naturally afraid of height differences, which is actually the intelligent cells of the body helping us out before we learn we can fall and hurt ourselves, which we'll cover better as we discuss the body. But fear of heights and fear of flying, basically, we can refer to fear of death for this ex explanation. Fear of the dark. If you know someone who's afraid of the dark, are they really afraid of the dark? Or are they rather really afraid of what could happen to them in the dark? What is it there in the dark that they can't see that could hurt them? Because really that's what they're afraid of, not the dark itself. It's what they can't see that could be threatening them that scares them. Potential devaluation that's lurking in the dark. Next, fear of intimacy. Ladies, ain't that one a bitch? I mean, not to stereotype because women can be caught by this one also, but we hear about a lot of men who have intimacy issues, right? Well, what is really happening here is that Opening up to someone to show them what they perceive is their warm, gooey, jelly-filled center inside them. If that gets rejected, it's a devaluation of the ego, that warm, jelly-filled center. So some people have a fear of getting even somewhat close to that. Thus, fear of potential devaluation occurs. Fear of failure. No brainer. Your accomplishments and self-image land squarely within the laundry list of things you see as you. Thus, failure to achieve those accomplishments or having to face the fact that you are not a person who can succeed at whatever it is, generates the fear. There's a potential devaluation of ego there. Fear of change, another easy one. When you're comfortable with your world, any change in that world could be a valuation increase or it could be a valuation decrease. So it's better not to change anything because the devaluation could be at stake. Okay, so that's all well and good, but it gets a little boring, right? Let's go to some good examples that might hit a little more close to home. How fear affects us in our everyday lives is really what's at stake here, isn't it? 
So let's talk about the fears that can affect your life in a way that makes your life harder. How about the fear of ending a bad relationship because of the various thoughts that stop you from doing so? And maybe this is you or someone you know. You or they are in a bad relationship. You're not happy, but you can't quite bring yourself to end it. Why? Well, first there's the fear of the unknown. Will I be able to find someone else to be with? This is a potential egoic devaluation because you could be rejected by others in the future. Next, there's a fear of your change in your self-perception. You know the definition of your ego now, and even though you're not happy with the relationship, what if you end it and your life gets worse by being alone? That's a potential egoic devaluation that can stop you from making a positive change in your life. Lastly, there may be money issues at stake, or kids in the mix, or family perceptions of you. All of these offer opportunities for less than stellar outcomes in your mind, which could provide for an additional egoic devaluation for you, which causes the fear to not end the relationship. So you stay in the relationship because of fear, and then the crappy relationship that you now must accept becomes a portion of your ego, and it starts to make you sad. And if it continues to make you sad, you can descend into depression. Go see the last episode to fully understand that one. And by the way, that same tendency can keep you in a crappy job and lead you to hate your job and be fearful of changing it at the same time. Okay, so how about dating anxieties? You're single and you would love to talk to that pretty girl or boy across the room that works with you, who you know is also single, but you're afraid to because they might reject you. Or more accurately, they might reject the laundry list of things that your mind seizes you, which includes your body, your thoughts, your beliefs, your sense of humor, etc. And this is, of course, is a potential devaluation of your egoic existence. Therefore, fear stops you from ever taking the chance of having a good love. Okay, so I think we've got a pretty good grasp on fear and how it works. Take the laundry list of the ego, introduce a situation where a potential internal devaluation could be applied to something on that list, and fear will be generated. Period. And just like in episode 8, the more attached you are to that thing on your ego list, the more pronounced the fear. The prospect of you losing your job might scare you a medium amount because you're attached to your job and what it means to you a medium amount. Well, if a child or another family member falls seriously ill, you might experience more fear as that you are more attached to that person than you are your job. Here's the reality of the situation. Fear is a lie. And it's a lie that inhibits you from leading an awesome life. And Beyond the natural components of fear that help you back away from that ledge naturally or give you that little boost of adrenaline to run a little faster from the bear, fear is unnecessary and unwarranted, especially when it comes to the false self of the mind, because something that's based on a lie can only be a lie. Okay, so now, the $64,000 question. How do we get over fear? Simply knowing that the ego is an invented understanding of the mind is not enough to quell negative emotions like fear. Because in the absence of an alternative understanding of self, your mind defaults to the false perception when defining your existence within your mind. You can't just say to yourself, my ego is an illusion and have your life get all better. Because remember, all this emotional stuff happens below the surface. And so for you to be able to reduce negative emotional influence in your life, one or both of two things has to happen. One, that you get your unconscious mind to manually change itself after many attempts to change your perceptions. And or two, that you have an experience that allows for your mind to gain a better understanding of your true self, which replaces its understanding of the false self. Which is why, if you've been keeping up with past episodes, that we have our twofold path. The first path is that of mindful manipulation to adjust our understanding of self consciously in a way that reduces the pain within us based on our new understanding of the emotional process, right? The second path is the one that takes us along practicing the disciplines that will eventually help us with our spiritual awakening, which by default helps us displace the ego, the existence of which is the basis for all negative emotion, which we've proven over the last 11 episodes or so. So in regards to fear, a practical way to deal with fear on our first path is to try to mindfully adjust our definition of self. And as that fear in most incarnations is an emotion that often comes at a time where action can or should be taken, let's start with an affirmation. Say to yourself, I am not one who is fearful or threatened by this situation. I am one who takes action. 
So in the case that your kid gets injured while playing a sport, you can now be less fearful and more calm in taking the action required to care for them. I am not one who is fearful or threatened by this situation. I am one who takes action. In the case of you being too afraid to ask someone out on a date, you can now identify that the only thing at stake is an illusionary mindful identity. And now you can be that person who takes action to go ask them out and be okay if they turn you down. I am not one who is fearful or threatened by this situation. I am one who takes action. In the case of you needing to end a chapter in your life, even though you're scared of what the future might bring, you can now identify a little better with being the person that takes charge and changes things regardless of what bumps in the road might await you during the change process. I am not one who is fearful or threatened by this situation. I am one who takes action. Then, as part of our second path, go meditate. Do yoga, practice contemplative prayer, take up Tai Chi, get into a pattern of calming your mind because we're going to soon learn that the brain's natural state is one of activity independent of your input and thus your mind is always working, always distracting, always defining things, including you, which leads us back into pain and suffering and negative emotions. So practice quieting the mind because this is the second part of our twofold path that will allow us to break one of the four components that will stop the creation of negative emotions entirely. And stay patient. This is a process. We're getting to the point where we can explain the big picture rather soon. Homework. For this week's homework, I want you to find 15 minutes at least three times this week, and I want you to meditate. I want you to calm your mind for that amount of time because your ego exists within your mind, and when your mind is silenced, your ego is silenced, and we need to practice that. I don't want you to think about this podcast or tomorrow's troubles or yesterday's woulda, coulda, shouldas. I want you to transport your mind to a place of peace and quiet where you can simply listen to the silence. If you need to, imagine yourself sitting on a beach or in a quiet forest or on top of a beautiful mountain. Picture yourself all alone and soak in the silence. Appreciate the beauty. Don't think about it, just look at it. Be quiet, be at peace. Let the peace of that place seep into you. You'll be amazed at how it changes you without having to go anywhere. Don't forget you can get a free audiobook from audible.com by going to www.audibletrial.com slash Spirituality. They have over 85,000 titles and signing up for the 14 day free trial allows you to get any one of them for free. There are tons of spiritual books there. I just added another one from Deepak Chopra to my wish list and Deepak reads it himself. I love Audible. You'll love them also. And you'll save tons of money because every month you pay 15 bucks, but you get a credit, which is then good for any book at any price for that credit. So that $50 Pima Chodron book from last week, I paid 15 bucks for it. You can get it for free if you sign up for the free trial. Go to www.audibletrial.com slash Spirituality. Next, if you have time, stop by iTunes or Blackberry and drop us a written review and share that we exist to your friends and family. <laughs> Facebook is an easy way to do that, but you can also click the share buttons on the website if you're interested in doing so. It's where we also offer up some written posts, by the way. Twitter, twitter.com slash Spirituality. Facebook, facebook.com slash Spirituality. Next week, we're gonna cover the non-egoic mind before moving into the spiritual perspective of the body. Awesome stuff coming. Know that I love you. That's why I'm doing this. See you next week. Peace.